right, and we're live with Justin Donald. Justin, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Wes, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for dropping in on the Path to Freedom podcast with me. We were just talking before we started recording how small of a world it is. Uh, I got introduced to you uh, through a new app, I guess it's maybe not that new, but new to me at least, called Clubhouse. And you were on there, uh, I guess, hosting a room, kind of promoting uh, your book, The Lifestyle Investor, that just came out. And I was like, man, this is, this is interesting. I love everything this guy has to say. I ordered the book. And then literally just like a few days later, I was talking to a mutual friend of ours, Eric Van Horn. Uh, Eric was recently on my podcast. And uh, I know you've been on his and he's been on yours. So uh, it was just kind of a, a small world to find out that you and Eric have been friends for years as well. So um, glad that we connected and super excited to have you on the podcast and uh, sharing all your knowledge with the audience. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I love just uh, the name of your podcast, the brand, what it stands for, you know, to, to just really uh, live freedom in your life. I think it's great. And I think it's very serendipitous the way that we met because uh, I am, I'm not on Clubhouse much. I've been on Clubhouse two times. I've only hosted one room. <laughs> yeah. I hosted that room at my friend's request saying, hey, I want to help you with the book launch. This is my way to help you. I'll, I'll start this room and you know, you, we can be co-hosts and then I'll invite some moderators. And I'm like, what does that even mean? So now <laughs> yeah, I get it okay. all. It was well, pretty cool. Yeah, you did a great job. And I don't know if you guys came up with any way to like track, you know, how much uh, traffic Clubhouse drove for book sales for you, but you got at least one from it because I did order your book uh, that night that I heard you talking on Clubhouse and uh, have had a chance to read it since then. And, um, you know, I think what, you talk about and what your book is about the lifestyle investor goes hand in hand with you know what I try to talk about here on the podcast what you know I'm in the process of building in my own life and hopefully through this podcast helping other people figure out how they can do in their own lives which is just create freedom for themselves and and I know that's something that you're a big believer in as well so for the, for those listening in though that may not be familiar with you yet uh, may not you know, have, have any idea what you mean when you say lifestyle investor, I guess, maybe start by giving us just a little bit of background on yourself. And then talk to us a little bit about this concept of the lifestyle investor that, uh, that I know you live, but now you're, you know, really teaching to others as well. Yeah, sure. Great question. I really am more of a practitioner than anything. So I've been investing for 22 years of my life in some way, shape or form. I got into alternative investments probably 15 years ago, and part of the alternative investments were real estate, but I was exposed to a lot of different things as well. I also have started different businesses and helped scale businesses. Since I've had hands-on experience with my own business, it's been easy to kind of advise and consult other entrepreneurs on how to do that same thing for their business. So mm -hmm. a component of what I did for a while really was in this entrepreneurial space where I was coaching people uh, to create better systems or build out recruiting or sales or comp structures or whatever it is yeah. and just help them replace themselves so they're not the bottleneck to their business. But over time, my passion, which has always been freedom and, and being able to live a life on your terms and a life by design, that, that really has been you know, what to me life is about. I wanted to get out of the space, you know, before I wanted to kind of help rescue entrepreneurs from getting in their own way, because I was one of them who got in my own way. Sure. But what I found during the time I would coach them is that I was always helping them redirect funds to other things and not put all their cash into or all their profits rather back into their business to, you know, put them elsewhere. And so a portion of my conversation always had to do with how to invest in passive income, you know, how mm -hmm. to create passive income, how to invest in assets that produce passive income. And that to me is, is what the lifestyle investor is all about. And that's why I really wanted to create this brand is to create awareness that there is a way that you can live life on cash flow where you buy assets that produce the cash flow it costs you to live your life. Yes. And by doing so, you're able to buy your time back. When you buy your time back, you can spend it however you want. So 
If you want to travel for a long extended periods of time, you can. And if you want to work hard because you're passionate about a project because you have the time to get into whatever you want, you can. You can use your gifts as you choose. You can hang out with people that are most meaningful in your life. There's just so much that buying your time really helps to produce. And a lot of people are so busy chasing this, this net worth or nest egg number, yeah. just trying to accumulate more. But the, the, if you look at like indicators of a successful business, you're going to see that it's the cash flow statement, not sure. the profit and loss statement or the balance sheet. I mean, these are important. And it's the same with your life, cash flow. Having the cash flow to live a life that you desire, that really is what lifestyle investing is all about. No doubt. I, I love that way of thinking. And I love the term you use, you know, buy your time back, right? Because I know one of the things that really opened my eyes to this way of thinking versus more of the, I guess, traditional way of thinking, which is, you know, you work for 40 some years until you're in your early 60s, you save money, and then you retire, and then you do whatever you want to do. Well, you know, I read Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. And, you know, he talked about the fact that a lot of people, they get to that point, they retire, and they realize they're miserable. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so he talks about, you know, setting your life up so that you can, you know, take what he calls mini retirements and go try different things and travel for extended periods of time. But to, to do that, you need passive income, right? Um, so I, I love this way of thinking. But, you know, maybe for the audience sake, back up a little bit, because you said you've been investing in some form or fashion for 22 years. But, you know, I think a lot of people hear that and they say, well, that sounds great, but I could never do that, right? Passive income sounds great, but how can I get to that point? Um, you know, what, what were you doing before you started investing, before you owned businesses? Because um, I'm thinking maybe that'll give people uh, some hope that there's a pathway for just about anyone that sets their mind to, to wanting to live this type of a life. Yeah, you know, when I first started out, it, when I say I've invested for 22 years, I mean, when I was 18, that means I started investing and I wasn't necessarily making that crazy of money, but mm. I put away enough to max out my Roth IRA back then, which was, I think, $5,500 a year. Yep. You know, that comes out to $105 a week. That's not a lot of money, but what I yeah. did is I disciplined a habit. Yes. And that habit stuck. And as I started to make more money, I started to save and invest more money. And so it really started as this decision just to do it, just to, you know, really protect the future me and not try to consume with everything that I make. And so that, that's it. I mean, my message is, you know, it might sound like, oh, wow, he's been investing for a long time. But it's, you know, when I first started, it was just, I didn't know what I was doing. I just did what I thought was best. I just did that to the best of my ability. It wasn't until like a decade later, I really figured stuff out. But I had the habits in place. Yeah. And so, you know, once I was able to find better investments, that made more sense to me, uh, then it, it was easy to have the capital to deploy because I was already used to allocating a certain amount per year. But I would just set aside a portion of each paycheck I made because yeah. that to me was the easiest way. Yeah, I think that's so key, right, is building the habits. You don't have to you know, have hundreds of thousands of dollars that you can invest to be able to start. You, you have to start somewhere. And, and even if it's just a small amount each week or each month, building those habits is so key, I think. Um, but you, you know, you also talked a little bit about alternative investments. What do you, what do you mean when you say alternative investments? So really for me, it's anything that is not the stock market or anything that's okay. not a cash equivalent. So you've got, you know, your stocks, your bonds, you've got your cash equivalents, which would be gold or silver. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could be T-bills or, or anything of that sort. And to me, it's, I mean, it started with real estate. So to me, at first, the, equi you know, the alternative investment was real estate. But that broadened once I understood more about what alternative investments were. And once I understood, you know, this world of debt and this world, you know, where, where you can lend and get great returns. And 
this world of investing in companies and private equity, just operating companies and the unique structures that you can do there. So, you know, it, it has since expanded, but it really began with real estate. It began with mobile home parks and I've done single family homes. I started a single family home maintenance company with a couple of friends that really took off. And at one point we were wanting to scale the home side uh, and we later realized that wasn't smart and we just need to scale the maintenance portion of it for people that owned the homes. So I've been in that space a lot. I had my own home that I, my very first home that I owned, you know, I turned that into a rental. So I've had experience in that, but I really found that uh, mobile home park investing for me was the best return on my money for the least amount of work. Mm. And it provided a lot of cash flow that I later then had to redeploy in something else. Because once my lifestyle expenses were covered, I had a surplus of cash coming in. And so then I had to get really, you know, smart or wise to not just spend that money, but find other assets that I could buy or invest in that produce income. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear how you kind of you know, started getting into this alternative investing, started with real estate, in particularly started with mobile home parks, which I think is probably something that most people are not thinking of as, as an investment opportunity. Um, but as you said, as you started earning more and more passive income through your investments, you had to continue learning and gaining more knowledge to then figure out what to best do with the cash flow that you had coming in, how to continue investing that. I'm sure there were you know, all types of tax implications and tax strategies that you had to figure out. And, and I think it's important for people to, to hear this portion of your story, because again, I think so many people think, you know, when they see someone like you that, you know, now you've got books out, you've got a podcast, you've clearly done very well for yourself, but they think, yeah, but you know, could I do that? Right. What, what do I know about, you know, alternative investments or creating passive income? So I like it, you know, when, when people like yourself come on here and kind of tell their story or at least a portion of their story of how they got to where they are today, because for most successful entrepreneurs like yourself, you know, they, they started somewhere. And so, you know, I guess my question for you is, cause, cause I've heard you say this in, in another podcast of yours that I listened to anyone that sets their mind to it can become a lifestyle investor. Like you talk about in your book. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah, most certainly. I mean, here's the thing. I, I didn't grow up knowing how to do any of this. Right. I didn't grow up with a family. I, you know, I grew up very working class. My dad uh, either sold appliances or cars or fixed appliances uh, for a living. He still does. He, he actually sells cars now. Um, and then my mom worked at our church and, you know, that was it. You know, she was a secretary. So I mean, that is until she retired, uh, you know, early on in my life, she was a teacher, but um, I don't really have many memories of that. Most of my memories of her were just, you know, working as a secretary in the front office of, of the church that we went to. And um, that, that was it. And so the people around me, you know, my friends really, you know, their parents didn't do anything like I'm talking about. I had one friend that his dad owned a business, but I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. It was a software company and I just didn't even understand what software was. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I mean, it, it was a big leap. So to me, when I say anyone can do it, I really mean that because I started out with nothing and I worked hard and I figured it out and I was a student of the things that I wanted to learn. And when I found people that were smarter than me, I latched on to them. Yeah. But before I found those people, I just latched on to books from those people. So I knew I always wanted to write a book because of the impact that those books that I read early on, Robert Kiyosaki books. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, I, I read a whole slew of books when I was younger, but Robert's really, you know, has stood out to me and I, I feel like had a, a pretty lasting impact. Yeah. And uh, me. yeah. So to me, it's just anyone who wants to do it. It's, it's not about what is your socioeconomic class it's more what's your mindset around it because the mindset is going to dictate everything if you have a poor mindset then you're probably going to grow up to be poor and if you have a wealthy mindset you're probably going to grow up to be wealthy it's that your mind is going to dictate that a lot more and your peer group and then your mentors so if you think about like what are the greatest impacts and influences on you 
It's what's the information you're consuming? Yep. Who are the people you're hanging out with? Who are the people that are investing in you that you look up to and respect? You know, and, and then what type of work ethic do you have to get the things that you want? That to me spells success in anything that you want to do, whether it's lifestyle investing, being a doctor, you know, being the best salesperson at whatever company. Yeah, I think that's, that's so key. I mean, you know, it's the old saying, you're the average of the, you know, what, five people you spend the most time with. But, uh, you know, mindset is something that I, I know for me, at least it wasn't until probably six or seven years ago, I started seeing kind of the connection between mindset and our relationship with money. Um, and, and so I think that's a very important thing that people need to realize is you need to first of all, it's like sit down and think about what is your relationship with money? How do you think about money? Like some people don't make money because they feel like maybe they're a bad person if they, if they make money, right? Or some people, you know, maybe they grow up poor, so they just have the mindset that I'll never have any money. But once you kind of get that mindset right and get your relationship right with money, uh, it, it almost seems like opportunity kind of starts flowing towards you, or at least that's been my experience. Yeah, for sure. I, I think you will be a lot more likely to attract what it is that you want into your life. But also I think you're just going to be open to different ideas. You know, if you're closed to these opportunities, then stuff passes you by. But if you are open to them and, and you're thinking not, I can't do this, but how could I do this? I think it really encourages you or, or, you know, you, what happens is you end up being more resourceful, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's, whether that's conscious or subconscious. And that is the power in it. It's like asking yourself better quality questions, you know, and, and it's also just spending time with people that play the game of life at the level you want to play it at, because they're going to expose you to their type of thinking, which I guarantee is different than yours. I mean, this was so true for me. I, I would hang out with people that were getting the results that I wanted early on in my career, once I figured out who those people were, and I was just like, impressed, they lived in a different world, their, their mindset was, it was just, I was like, how did you learn to think this way? Right? Yeah. And, and that's it. It's just the exposure. That, that's it. It's you could get it from books, you can get it from podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I, I honor you for putting something out like this, where you're helping people get there. Uh, you know, as am I, I, I think it's really important uh, in whatever type of information people are going to consume, but it can happen by hiring a coach. It can by, happen by just someone taking you under their wing. It can happen. you know, one of the things I made a, a, a career of doing uh, even early in my business career was taking someone out to lunch or coffee once a week, once to twice a week was my goal. And generally the, I would try to hit two times, but I had a very long streak of taking someone out once, uh, at least once a week. And uh, that was just, it, it was a, I, I can't even put into words the shift that that made mentally to my confidence, to just the ideas that I had. Oh, I bet. And I, I mean, I'm guessing the people that you're taking out to lunch or coffee are people that were better than you at something that you knew you at everything at, right <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least yeah. i felt that way i felt like they're better at everything than me yeah well that you know that's one of the questions that i wanted to ask you and i think you've really pretty much answered the question in a few different ways but like so many people spend the majority of their life just kind of being a slave to their job or you know however you want to put it and they never you know really seem to live life to the fullest or the way they would want to but you know as you've just talked about anyone can learn these things so I guess my question for you was why don't more people but you know I, I think you've already kind of answered it indirectly it's it it's not going to fall into your lap you have to proactively go out there look for people that have the knowledge that you want or that you need to do what you want to do with your life and then go learn it <clears throat> but it's out there especially in this day and age like you said there's books there's podcasts I mean there's so many places that you can go to get this knowledge, but you do have to be proactive with it. Yeah, success leaves clues. So, you know, the, the whole idea is if you're willing to mirror and model someone else that has gotten the results that you desire to get, you can also get them. 
but it does take a commitment. It takes a belief. So that's why I always say it starts with mindset because yeah. you have to believe you can do it because there's ample info. And the way I'm talking about doing it is just one of many ways. That's just sure. the way I did it. Yeah. There's so many ways to create financial independence and financial freedom. And the, the resources are truly abundant, but someone mm -hmm. really needs to believe that they can do it. And that really is going to steer the ship. And I had to fight against these beliefs that weren't my own when I first was growing up because my parents had this scarce mindset around money. Like there was never enough and, and that's okay. Like I don't, I'm not, I don't feel bad, you know, that, that, that was what I grew up in and I don't blame them. I think that's their framework. And I think their sure. parents were even more scarce, you know, that, than, than mine, you know, yeah. there's, it was just very scarcity minded, but I would catch myself saying money doesn't grow on trees, you know, and I was making good money at a certain point in time, like early in my professional life. And I'm like, why do I even say this? <laughs> Where's this what, come where from? Where did I get this from? And it's yeah. just, and there's so many of these beliefs you just take from your parents or people that, that you know, and you just adopt them as your own without even considering what it means and, and the whole scheme of things. And I was like, I got to stop saying that because that makes me like believe that there's not a lot of money out there when in fact I know there's a lot out there because I see the people with it. Yeah. That, I, I think, you know, talking about mindset shifts, I mean, for me, it was a big part of it was coming to the realization that, you know, money is not a finite resource. Um, it's, it's really an infinite resource. And then you have to get, you know, comfortable with being someone that is capable of acquiring money. And then of course, coming up with a plan of how you're going to do that and then learning everything you can to execute that plan. Um, but yeah, again, it comes back to mindset, right? I mean, so much of this, I think always comes back to mindset. Well, and let's, let's also take it one step further. Cause you, you mentioned this a second ago and I'd love to, you know, piggyback on it. Yeah. You're also fighting against routine and you're fighting against the way that it is. So mm -hmm. most people, you said, mo you know, most people are a slave to their business. So let's, let's take this from the ground level. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't own your own company, most people are a slave to their job. Yep. And, and if it's not their job, they're a slave to the income that they make. They're a slave to the security that they have or the mm -hmm. illusion of security that yes. they have. Good point. Which, you know, this year we realize that more than ever, you know, it's, it's kind of, interesting to me, like banks really consider when someone is an employee that that type of income is safe and that type of job is safe. And it to me is the same thing as living in this fancy neighborhood that had it's a gated community. And so therefore, you're like, Oh, we live in a safe neighborhood because we have a gate, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. yeah, I'm telling you, if someone wants to get in a gates not going to stop them. That's yeah. just an illusion of security. Right. Definitely. And, and that's 100%. what most jobs are, is an illusion of security. And when you have that security, then that you, you kind of like flex these muscles of, of needing that. And it's really hard to keep variety active. So then some people say, all right, well, I don't want to be a slave to a job. So I'm going to start my own business because I want freedom and I want autonomy and I want agency in my life. But they build this business thinking that's what they're going to get. And what really happens is they become an even greater slave to the business. They work yeah. more hours than they are working. Granted, they probably make more. Although in the beginning years, you probably make less, yeah. right? But in yeah, time, no you could probably make more. You can build systems. You can leverage people. You can leverage technology. So in the long haul, you might work harder to make more. But it often can be a bigger trap because the harder you work, the more you make. Mm -hmm. And then you're, and then you get accustomed to this lifestyle. You become a slave to the lifestyle or the money that you make. Yeah. So it's not just the business. You might be handcuffed to the business because without you, it doesn't run. And without someone making the decisions, you know, you can't scale properly. And so you're a slave to the business. You're a slave to the money that you make. You're a slave to the lifestyle that you become accustomed to, and you don't want to regress. Mm hmm but as you gain more, it's almost like your spending just keeps up. And so there's so many yeah. steps of the hamster wheel and that hamster wheel, you know, it's, it's one of those things where your goal is to have better quality 
problems. You're always going to have problems. I remember something Tony Robbins said. I, I went to a bunch of his events when I was younger. I went to all of his stuff. And uh, it had a huge impact on me. And one of the things that he said is, you know, if you're, you're always going to have problems, you know, mm -hmm. the only people that have problems are dead. So just realize you're going to have problems. The, the, the idea, the goal here is to have better quality problems. Sure. So maybe you are in a business that's a better quality problem. Maybe you have a job and you got a raise and that's a better quality problem, but there's always a problem to solve for. But the biggest solution is being able to buy your time back because mm -hmm. when you own your time you own everything and that to me is when you have the highest quality um you know problems and solutions because it doesn't like i would take having my time back than making 10 times what i make like i don't the goal is not to make more money the goal is to own my time yeah, I think that's such an important distinguishment that many people, if not most people, do lose sight of. I mean, I've lost sight of it. We own businesses and, you know, we're constantly working to set our businesses up as best as possible so that they run without us and we're making money whether we're working or not. Uh, I work with a lot of people to help them get into franchise businesses. You mentioned systems and processes. Uh, that's one of the, can be one of the biggest advantages to getting into a good franchise system. There's already systems and processes there that you can leverage. It's kind of a blueprint to follow. Different franchises are designed differently in terms of what they expect from the franchise owner from a time commitment standpoint. But I mean, it's, it's a constant battle and, and we have to remind ourselves because we got into business ownership uh, right after we had our first kid and my wife didn't want to go back to work full time. It was all about you know, wanting to buy our time back, but we still fight that battle sometimes where it's like it's constant tug of war where, you know, we'll kind of look at ourselves and be like, wow, we've been, we've been way too caught up in, in our businesses. We need to like pump the brakes a little bit. And so, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, then there's a good chance that you're looking to create more freedom in your own life. There's also a good chance that you realize that owning your own business can be a great way to take more control of your livelihood and create more of that freedom that we're all looking for. Also, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you realize that I specialize in franchise ownership. In addition to owning franchise businesses myself, I have a franchise consulting firm, Path to Freedom, where I help people navigate what is typically an overwhelming process of understanding franchising, identifying specific franchise companies that could be a fit, and then conducting the due diligence in a thorough and efficient manner with those franchise brands. My whole purpose here is to leverage my experience working for franchisors, owning franchises myself, and how we've been able to use that to create more freedom in our lives and help you determine if that could be a path that makes sense for you as well. So if any of this sounds interesting, if you've considered business ownership in the past, whether you've explored franchising specifically or not, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to learn more about you and what it is that you're working towards in your life and determine if I may be in a position to help. A great starting point is the link below in the show notes, which will take you to a short form to fill out and you'll receive a free copy of an ebook that I've put together, The Seven Steps to Freedom Through Franchise Ownership. That'll also get us connected, and I'd love to set up an introductory call where I can explain a little bit more about the process that I use to help people determine if franchise ownership could be a great way to start charting their own path to freedom. So click the link below in the show notes, receive the ebook, and let's get connected. I'd love to hear from you. What are, because I know you said you've, you've, own businesses, you've kind of been a bottleneck in your own businesses before. I believe you still have businesses today in addition to all the investing that you're doing. So, I mean, what advice might you give to someone that, that maybe is a business owner, but is also a bottleneck in their own business and, and feeling a little bit like they're a slave to their business? How, how have you been able to get out of that position? How have you been able to help other people get out of that position? It's a great question. The, it, it's all about the the who that is going to help kind of create that system so it's it's more the who than the how uh and and that really 
stems from finding the right people that can execute at a high level. So anytime someone is a bottleneck in their business, they're preventing it from scaling. Mm -hmm. Anytime that everything has to go through the business owner, even though they want that certainty, they want that control, you know, they often want that significance because it feels good. They're the decision maker. Uh, that's not how to scale. Scaling is putting things in place so that it doesn't require the business owner. And ultimately, you're not really running a business unless you can remove yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, you're running a sole proprietorship. And that's okay, too. There, I mean, there are a lot of people who have done very well for themselves with a sole proprietorship. Sure. But you're going to work more. You're going to work harder. You're going to have, you know, it, it's, it's going to take a lot more to scale uh, and you're also going to pay more taxes, you know, so that's true. There's <laughs> that's just, definitely uh, true. Yeah. So there's just, I, I would just say that to anyone who wants to eliminate their, you know, eliminate them as the bottleneck, bring someone on that is very system oriented, that can create a protocol to allow scale without people or without you at least to start. And as much of it that can go and run through a system as opposed to an arbitrary or subjective lineup of people, I think the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And, and I like how you put that. It's about the who, not the how. Um, and that's, you know, that's a question that my wife and I, you know, we'll try to ask ourselves regularly, like, could we sell this business and it not matter if like one of us came with it to stay on. Uh, Cause I think that's another thing that a lot of people don't really think through is not only could the business operate with or without you as the owner while you're still the owner, but if, if too much runs through you, you don't really have a business that you could sell either because any halfway educated buyer is going to realize that, you know, once you, the owner are out of the picture, they're going to have a lot of revenue to make up or, you know, whatever responsibilities you've been, handling in the business. So I think that's a good, good filter to look at is, you know, can this business operate just as well without me as it does with me? And would someone be interested in buying this business without me in the picture? Yeah. And, and so you'll see a lot of sales of companies. Well, number one, a lot of companies that won't sell, it's exactly that. Number two, if they do sell, then there are these arrangements and agreements where the owner has to stay on for four yeah. years. Earnouts. And Yes. And this is a very normal thing, especially when it's service based or, yep. you know, owner driven as opposed to more of a protocol based operation. So in your experience, are there certain types of businesses that are better suited to own that kind of go hand in hand with this lifestyle investor approach that you're taking? Yeah, there are, but it's less about the business and more about the structure. So, right. Yeah. You, business models, I guess. is, is Yeah. What. So you mentioned before franchises. I like franchises for a lot of reasons uh, because you don't have to figure out the program. It's already there. You just have to plug and play. And once you master that, then you can innovate. But I don't yeah. like to innovate things until I have an expertise in something because when someone else has it figured out uh, until I'm that good, I don't want to kind of mess with it, but yeah. I like other businesses as well, because maybe if I have an expertise in some area, well, it's nice to not pay those royalties out and that's just extra profit. But sure. I like to structure everything so that I'm a non operating owner. I like to bring in operators, whether they're equity partners or whether they're just paid really well. And I like to be a capital partner. I don't want to run the business. I just want to provide the capital. I want to help and utilize my network mm. to, you know, ensure that the business does well. So it can be in various different places. I mean, um, I bought a company uh, called KC Dogs just recently during this pandemic because, uh, you know, I have two partners that run one of the Orange Theory Fitness uh, studios that we bought and, and opened. And uh, they wanted to split up and have one run it and one do another business. I was like, all right, that's great. Well, right now everyone's buying dogs and everyone's home. And these it's dogs true. are, you know, just destroying their home and, and they're going to get them trained. And so we thought it'd be really cool to 
go ahead and buy this dog training company. And it's pretty cool because Patrick Mahomes trained his dog at our dog training company. No way. So I was just uh, KC, I was assuming it's Kansas. Yeah, that's yeah. right. No way. Yeah, so it's so uh, it's really just kind of a, a cool experience. And the business is growing and it's scaling. And there's so many people that have dogs that are like, I need this dog needs some help. Yeah, <laughs> or I need some help. You know, yeah, I've got that's one of just those. another example. So I've got partners that run it. I'm the capital partner, I'll look at the P&Ls. And I'll use my network and help connect the dots where I need to. But that to me is a good investment. You know, yeah. No, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, my wife and I have a business partner in, in our businesses and that's exactly what he does, right? I mean, and, and that's what we're on our way to doing right now. In fact, we are launching a new franchise business here in a couple of weeks and we've hired an operating manager uh, to run the day-to-day -day because we all have other responsibilities and you know we wanna earn some of our time back, right? Um, but you mentioned something earlier, either equity partners or they're paid very well. I think that's key because as you said, it's the who, not the how. You got to have good people and you got to be able to keep them if you are going to be able to kind of step back and, and not be too involved in your business. So uh, that's something I've definitely learned over the years is you don't want to cut corners by trying to you know pay people too little to do too much because that's not going to work. So I think that's a, a point worth reiterating whether it's equity or they're just compensated well, like in our case, our operations manager, he'll be compensated as though he were an owner, but he doesn't actually have any equity. Uh, yeah, I think that's great. And you, you just don't want to be stingy. I mean, create a win-win <laughs> scenario. You know, the salary that I pay uh, each of, of, you know, my operating partners in the two businesses I just mentioned are higher than what they were earning before. I mean, that, what a great start there. They're already getting a pay raise yeah. and they have equity, you yeah. know? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, it's a win-win. Uh, and then they'll crush it for you because they're so grateful for the opportunity. So you're going to win as well. And we all know it's more expensive to, uh, you know, have to rehire and retrain if you're having a lot of turnover. So, uh, but, you know, the other thing you mentioned there, uh, I like too, because with my work in franchising, I've learned this and this is something I find I have to do quite a bit of coaching with, with some people because, you know, they, they know they want to get into business for themselves. We talk a lot about different types of franchise business models that are out there. You know, there are some more owner operator type franchises where by design, the franchisee kind of wears all the hats, right? It's not a scalable business. Uh, and for some people that's fine, right? Because it gets them out of working for someone else, they still maybe have a little more control of their time and their schedule and they can earn more, right? So for some people, that's a good fit because those types of franchises tend to be less to get into as well. Um, but then you have other types of franchises that what they're looking for out of the franchise owners differ. And in some cases, they're really looking for someone with some capital and some business savvy that knows how to hire the right people, put them in place and, and let them grow the business, right? So what I do when I'm working with someone and we're going to try to find some franchise businesses that line up for them, is we first get clear on what they want their role to be in the business. Before we ever talk about products or services or what industry uh, they're going to be in. And to me, that's a good starting point because once we get clear on that, then we can go out and find franchise businesses that have a model that aligns with what they're looking for. So I thought that was uh, interesting that you brought that up as well. Yeah. And I think you want to be looking at, at what's better than not what's the best. So if you're working a job and you don't like it and you want to do something different, well, another job is likely better than, or starting in a business that maybe like a franchise that requires a lot of your time mm -hmm. that still possibly and probably better than what right. you are doing. So that's an upgrade. That doesn't mean you have to do that the whole time. At a certain point in your life, you're going to say, hey, I value my time a lot. So I need to bring someone else in. That means I won't make as much profit, but I actually am okay with that because if I'm not working as much or if I'm not working at all and I'm paying someone else and I'm still profiting, that's pretty good. And then I could even have another business. And so you're yeah. always... It's always a debate of what's better than what it was. 
And that's, so instead of just like beating yourself up because you don't have X, Y, Z or whatever, it's just these little steps. It's like, well, how do I make decisions that are better than my current situation? And if you keep doing that, you're going to get into a really good situation and you're going to feel really empowered the whole journey doing it. No doubt. Such, such a good point. I mean, you know, I, I think sometimes people look at where they are. They look at where other people are, you know, maybe five, six, 10 steps above them. And they think they've got to make that jump. And no, sometimes it's just step by step, stepping stones, learning as you go, applying what you've learned. And uh, to your point, you know, ultimately you can build a better and better quality of life for yourself. Most um, certainly. I, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about the book because, you know, I think everyone that listens to this podcast could absolutely benefit by reading the book. So it's called The Lifestyle Investor. And I've heard you talk a little bit, I think probably on Clubhouse when I first heard you, uh, about the story of why you decided to write the book anyways. Maybe quickly share that just because I think it's a cool story and and people would enjoy hearing it. Yeah. So I've been saying that I want to write a book for a long time. I've had friends that have asked me for years to write a book and nothing seemed to move the needle enough to get me to do it. Yeah. And then I had a conversation with one of my friends and we were, we were out walking and he said, Hey, have you ever considered the fact that you keep dragging your feet on writing this book, but what if you died and your daughter never knew this great wisdom that you have accumulated over the years? How would you feel? And I was like, oh man, that's horrible. (laughs) Uh, It's incredibly morbid, but it's just, I mean, it was such a punch to the gut. I mean, literally days later I started writing. What a good friend to to be able to ask you that pointed of a question. That's right. Yeah. He's, and he's never been afraid to do that because he, he values the relationship, not just um, you know, people liking him. Uh, yeah. and by the way, by default, I like him even more cause he's real, you know, and he's, you know, I mean, that was motivating. And I said, all right, well, I'm going to get this stuff out. And so really it was for my daughter and anyone else that benefited, they benefited. And, and I just felt so good and motivated and inspired to write it. And it just started to flow and it started to come together pretty quickly. And then I had a lot of my coaching clients kind of weigh in and I had people that read the different sections that I had. And uh, I just feel like I had a great community that supported me as I wrote it so that it would appeal to anyone. And my goal is that it could appeal to a novice, someone who's never really invested, but at the same time, appeal to a professional that maybe they've been an investor for a couple decades. And Um, I really believe I've accomplished that because I've heard great feedback from both sides of, you know, that spectrum. And, you know, the whole idea is I think everyone can get better at creating some asset income. And that's all that it is. It's taking a step towards that and figuring out what does it cost you to live? And what is that per month just to survive, not even what your current lifestyle is? And how do you create enough passive cash flow, passive income to cover that? And so I give all these different examples. I have my 10 commandments. These are, I call them the 10 commandments of cash flow investing for passive income and financial freedom. So it's the the subtitle of the book, Mm -hmm. but it's my 10 criteria for why I invest the way that I do. And I wanted to lay out not only these rules, but also uh, I wanted to lay out an example or two for each of them to model people can just model these they can find these same deals or similar deals like it and just structure the terms the same way it's very detailed um and like you said i think there's something in it for everyone uh like i would not consider myself a professional investor like we have a couple of businesses you know we plan to do more of that uh just invested in our first piece of real estate like four months ago a uh, piece of commercial real estate. My wife and I bought it. We're leasing it to our businesses that we own with a business partner. Um, so like far from a professional. So there was some stuff in there that was very, very appealing to me that I was somewhat familiar with, learned a lot more about it. And then there were some things in there. I was like, holy crap, I didn't even know people could do that. I didn't even know those opportunities were out there. And then I gave a copy to a good friend of mine that uh, hasn't done as much with businesses, but he's done a lot more with real estate. And, you know, he read it and was like, 
it blew his mind in, in terms of just some of the opportunities you talk about, but also how detailed you are with some of these examples. Um, but I, I love the, the 10 commandments of cash flow investing, and we don't have time to cover them here. I wouldn't want you to spoil it for anyone here. If you want the full thing, go get the book. Um, but like, yeah, would you, would you say this is an accurate statement? Like you compared to a lot of investors out there think outside of the box a little bit with how you structure some of your deals, I guess, even where you're finding some of these deals. Yeah. So really what, what you're going to notice is that there's a way to negotiate that most people don't even realize exists, that there are terms that you can structure that a lot of people have never considered. And there are deals that exist that you as a just regular investor are never going to have access to unless you know the right people. And mm -hmm. so there are deals out there where you can invest in a way where you're totally protected. Your odds of losing money are next to nothing, if not completely nothing, Yeah. Uh, but with incredible upside. And so, you know, most people don't know that that exists. Most people don't know that you can invest in a way where you can get your initial investment back within a year or two and reinvest it, but still have equity in a deal and still get to participate in the upside and, you know, get cash flow all along the way. I mean, there's just so many things out there that if you are willing to just learn and consider, uh, it can do wonders for your mindset to say, hey, I didn't know this existed. There must be a lot of other stuff I didn't know that existed. Yeah. And I'm, I, I want to be this, you know, uh, blank canvas, willing to learn and try something new and get out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, as you're developing these 10 commandments of cash flow investing, I mean, I'm sure it didn't happen overnight. I'm sure this is kind of a result of your years and years of experience and all the knowledge that you've acquired over the years. Um, but, but how long would you say that, you know, whether you've referred to it in this way or not, how long would you say that you've been investing by this principle of the 10 commandments of cash flow investing? Well, I mean, it's definitely involved over, uh, evolved over time. You know, when I think about one of, one of my commandments, um, the fourth or the fifth commandment is cash flow immediately. I mean, that's, that's fundamental to any of the investing that I've done to the vast majority. And that started with the cash flow that I saw in mobile home parks. And I think I got mm. spoiled seeing that, but I was like, well, I just, I want cash flow. If I'm going to invest in something, I should have cash flow, yeah. you know? So it started very early on, but as I got into different deals, um, sometimes I couldn't articulate what it was. Maybe it was a subconscious feeling, but over time, it was like, what, what is it that I like about these deals? And I was able to say, oh, I actually have a methodology that was a little bit more subconscious at first, mm. but now it's very conscious. And now it's, you know, I can kind of look at this checklist and, and say, oh, it matches it or it doesn't match it. Or this has a, a certain risk profile because it doesn't have these, you know, criteria or this one's just golden because it matches up to all 10. Yeah, I was going to ask. So now where you're at, does, does an investment have to check all 10 boxes for you to, to move forward with it or? It not does not. Yeah, does it not. does not. But to be, you know, the, the safer ones do the ones that, I mean, I, I feel like I've had just a tremendous amount of success with the ones that really do. But at this point, I'm also looking to place some of the income that I have. So I'm okay doing some things now that I have cash flow yeah. that I wasn't okay doing when I didn't have cash flow. Right. Sure. Yeah. Now, now that lifestyle is covered and we've got a great lifestyle. And I have extra surplus cash flow that comes in every month and I need to figure out what's best to do with it. So I have been able to deviate away from, you know, some of, of my core principles, but they're still there. I mean, I, I'm still going to do things that subscribe to the majority of them, right? Right. You're not deviating like completely off the 10 commandments. Yep. Um, and my so goal is to diversify. So like I want passive income, but then I want to diversify that passive income. And then when I've done that, I want to diversify the whole portfolio. Yeah. So is it a safe assumption that the fewer of the 10 commandments it meets, the higher the upside should be? Yeah. I mean, the fewer of the 10 commandments is going to be, so I don't, I don't always draw the parallel with the risk reward that a lot of people do like, Oh, mm. this one has a high return. It must be super risky or, 
You know, this one is not risky at all. That's why it's a teeny return. Uh. It doesn't always work like that. It's not this complete inverse relationship. But I would say that more risk is on the table, the less commandments are, are you know, fulfilled or hit. Sure. Yeah, makes sense. All I can say is go check out the book because it's, uh, it's packed full of information. I don't know if you have an audio book or not, but I'd recommend getting the hard copy because like mine's full of notes and I highlighted a bunch of stuff and it'll definitely be a book I go back and reread probably numerous times. Well, the... Um, yeah, and the, the hardcover, softcover, whatever, paperback, I mean, these have a glossary in them. Mm-hmm. So you can go back. I would recommend, I mean, I want people to dog ear the book and go back and forth and, oh, I just got this deal. Let me pull this out and let me look at this. Let me compare these terms. Maybe I should negotiate this with it. Um, I want people to do that. So I mean, part of the reason I have the glossary is to define everything so that you have one place to go and you understand definitions that I really wanted to simplify as best as I could. Uh, and then also all the proceeds of the book are going to charity. So there's a, an organization called Love Justice International that is all about human trafficking prevention. And okay. they're set up in 17 different countries doing amazing oh, wow. work. Yeah. So I didn't even know that. That's awesome. I'm, I yeah. must have missed that when you guys were talking about it in that clubhouse room that night. So yeah, even better. It's You'll learn a lot about lifestyle investing and you'll help a great cause as well. Um, you know, I know you're busy, so we'll wrap this up here. Just, you know, one more question that I guess comes to my mind. I know a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are, you know, they're, they're kind of in the early stages of charting their own path to freedom, right? So like for someone that, you know, maybe they've been doing the, you know, the basics with their Roth IRA and putting some money into a 401k, maybe some mutual funds and that sort of thing. But they're, they're, wanting to do more of the alternative investing, but, you know, maybe capital is a little bit limited. Like where, where would you recommend starting in terms of not only just learning, but also like actually taking some action and, you know, investing some money into some of these alternative investments that you talk about? Well, I'm going to say what I think. I mean, this is what I say in my own podcast, right? My podcast, The Lifestyle Investor. At the end of each episode, I say, just take action. Take mm-hmm. one step towards living the life that you desire, a life by design, not a life by default, and, you know, move towards financial freedom. And and that can happen in a variety of different ways. It can happen by getting someone in your network that has some expertise. It can happen by investing in a deal with someone that you know has a good track record. It could uh, happen from reading this book or any other book that could help you out. You know, I'm not, I'm not partial to my stuff. I mean, I just want people to learn and grow and and, you know, do great things. And so, I mean, beyond even what I've got uh, in terms of the book, I mean, there's a ton of stuff on my website that uh, I've got tons of free content. Yep. And then I've got an email list that, that uh, people really love. And then I've got an online course. I've got all kinds of, you know, different stuff on there. You know, there's a mastermind, there's a private coaching, there, there's a bunch of different things. So if you're looking for outlets, you know, obviously the podcast is free. Mm-hmm. Um, the book you know, costs a little something, but not much. The course costs a little more. Yep. There's a master class. Um, and, and each step of the way, it, it has more cost to it. But I got a bunch of really good free stuff. And uh, if you go to the if you go to my website, lifestyleinvestor.com forward slash book, I've got a bunch of free items. You had talked about the the audible, the audio book that is coming out in March. So that okay. will be available. But right now, the first third of the book Part one is available um, when you go on the website. So it's, uh, you know, I, I can't remember if it's set up right now. Is uh, <laughs> launch week versus now is a little different. So I can't remember if it's free plus shipping or if there's a cost plus shipping. I think it's sure. free plus e- shipping. Either way, it's a good deal. Yeah. And you get a bunch of cool stuff. Yeah. We'll link all that in the show notes because I, I did have a chance to check out your website. And you're right. It's loaded with tons of great resources, a lot of free information. Uh, the podcast is also on your website. Uh, I had a chance to listen to three or four of the episodes already. Great content, great guests that you have on as well. So definitely make sure to check out Justin's podcast and for sure pick up the book. Um, real quick before I let you go, if you're okay with it, I have a lightning round. It's the same four questions that I ask every guest that comes on the podcast. We'll run through these real quick if you can give me another 10 seconds. Okay. 
What's the best piece of advice you ever received, business or life advice? That your peer group matters more than just about anything else. Love it. What book are you currently reading right now? Ooh, I've got that right here. Incredible Parents by my okay. friend Brandon Miller. All right. I'll have to check that out. I have a two-month-old at home. Uh, what is your, do you have any sort of a morning routine, anything that you try to do every morning to prime yourself for a successful day? Yes. I read, I journal, I pray, and uh, those three things are a must. And I work out shortly after that, after hanging with, with my family. I love it. Final question. What is your definition of freedom and are you living it? Uh, so yes, I'm living it because it's owning your time and being able to spend it in the way that suits you best and allows you to share your gifts best with the world. So that, that to me is everything. And I just encourage people to take one step towards what that will look like for them in their life. That's right. Take action. Or as we say here on the path to freedom podcast, go drop in. Hey, Justin, man, cannot thank you enough for making time to do this. Really appreciate it. Glad that we connected. If there's ever anything I can do to help you, let me know. But you're an inspiration, man. Keep doing everything that you're doing. Really appreciate you. Thanks, Wes. It's been a lot of fun. We'll talk soon. All right, man. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you.